thanks to the Stanford Alumni Association for offering me this opportunity. And thank you guys all for coming. I am so excited to be here and tell you a story that's really about a personal journey of mine as well. I started really my professional career in Yellowstone and I have kind of always worked there in my heart and in my you know, in, in form, I've taken many students there and I have loved taking Stanford travelers there as well. So this is a story about really how a large remote place that has relatively an, you know, an, a, an intact ecosystem and how it has become smaller and more confronted by humans um, and, be, and because of that is really emblematic for the, emblematic for the planet. Um, it's a story of time and place and um, thank you so much for coming and listening. Yellowstone was set aside as the world's first national park in 1872 by President Grant. And these 2 million acres were set aside for the benefit and the enjoyment of the people, which is been something that has been uh, characteristic and really emblematic of the preservation of this place and other parks in the nation and around the world. Yellowstone has global significance, not just because it was the world's first national park, but because it's become a UNESCO World Heritage Site, a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve where the presence of humans and biodiversity has been lauded. As it's about 2 million acres, it occupies parts of three states. It was there before the states were, and so it has really unique policies um, that, that uh, govern this place. And now there are up to 4 million people that go there per year, uh, just about 19,000 of them in the winter. The other thing that's important, and I'll talk a little bit about this, is that all native, i.e. pre-European uh, colonization of the Americas, all native species are present in the park. And that means it's the core of the relatively largest tempered attack ecosystem in the world, the Yellowstone ecosystem. It is America's crown jewel. The first national park, this is what it looked like to travel in the park. And today there are over, as I said, 4 million visitors, bringing humans right up front and close to, uh, close and personal to wildlife. Yellowstone has a story to tell about damage to the system, but recovery as well. And in this way, it presents a beautiful example for wild places and humans around the world. We know that this uh, Yellowstone houses a complex food web, a complex ecosystem that's evolved over time. There are components that involve, you know, microbes in the hot springs all the way up and support our top predators. And the nutrients cycling through this landscape and through the animals in it are, are really well studied and super important for understanding how the elimination of certain species and the introductions of others may influence um, these processes. The remarkable thing is this place was covered completely by ice. In my mind, just a very short time ago, 18,000 years ago, here Yellowstone sits under what was known as the Yellowstone ice cap. It was covered by up to a mile of ice and everything in the Yellowstone ecosystem had to be colonized by life since 18,000 years ago. So this assembly uh, has taken place in a geologically very fast time period. We know that vegetation has changed over this time. Here you see uh, a time scale here from 14,000 years ago to the present. So prior to 14,000 years ago, this was covered by ice. And as you go from tundra on this, uh, so uh, uh, sorry, 8,000 feet, but around um, deglaciation, that became what was known as a tundra, uh, tundra vegetation. And then kind of is colonized by relatively consistent forest for the last 10,000 years. Same is true with the central plateaus in Yellowstone at about uh, 8,000 feet in, uh, in elevation. These are mostly lodgepole pine and then um, uh, a mixed grassland and conifer forest uh, at lower elevations of the park. So over this last time period, what's known as the Holocene 
it's a relatively constant period of, of climate change. There's very little kind of climate ex, uh, excursions here. The temperatures remain relatively constant and the vegetation and animals have as well. But then humans from Europe came and remember there were Native Americans here and the Native Americans colonized the Americas right around the same time that they were deglaciated. Um, the Hayden exploration was one of several early explorations from uh, to the West. But this exploration was different in that it had photographers, particularly William Henry Jackson, and an extraordinary artist, Thomas Moran. They were able to bring images of this extraordinary place in full color back to the East, back to the policymakers in and around uh, Washington, DC. And that was instrumental in basically conferring an emotional attachment of Americans to this place that they had never visited. It also speaks to the role of art, science, biodiversity, and policymaking, communication of this place that is really uh, close and very important to my, my own personal uh, journey. With European expansion came the desire to control life, to control how biodiversity uh, works in the system. And in particular, because we were expanding with our crops and with our domesticated animals, mostly cows and horses, uh, we also exerted an immense amount of predator control in, this, in, in the whole Western United States. We were very effective. Bounties in Montana resulted from an estimate, resulted in a reduction of around 200,000 wolves to total extinction by the 1940s. And in Yellowstone, the last known wolf was shot in Soda Butte Creek, very near to this photo in the background in 1937. One of the questions since that time that governed um, the, the dynamics of species in Yellowstone was whether or not the extinction, the extirpation of wolves in Yellowstone caused some sort of unusual rebound in elk. I want to point out here that the last wolf was shot in 1937. This is the year, so 1960 to, the, to 1994, 95. So the mean numbers, I don't have these numbers on here, but the mean, mean population size of elk in the Yellowstone ecosystem from about 1929 to 1960 was around 8,000, which is what you see on this red line. Wolves were introduced, sorry, wolves were again shot out in 1937. And so for decades, the population size remained around 8,000. It took a dip in the 60s, and then it started to expand in the 70s. The fires of 88 really uh, marked a watershed uh, environmental change in this area. Populations of elk declined and they started to rebound again and wolves then were reintroduced in 1995. It turns out that this question and the dynamics of wolves and elk turned out to be super important to me. This ended up being what I ended up working on for both my master's and my PhD, was trying to determine if elk were native or if they were in fact pushed up in some way because of this colonization and this expansion of, of Europeans across the Great Plains and whether or not wolves were native. In excavations of several sites in Yellowstone, predominantly this one known as Lamar Cave in the, in the northeastern part of the park, I found, I identified over 10,000 mammal, mammal specimens. There were thousands of birds, all sorts of other animals as well, snakes, reptiles, amphibians. And it turns out that what I found out is that in fact, wolves and elk were both native to Yellowstone. Here is a wolf. Uh, this is a coyote for scale. This is a grizzly bear, a weasel, and a skunk, for example. So wolves and elk both were native to Yellowstone, and they had been so for thousands of years. And that served as one of the fundamental kind of, uh, kind of the, the, the fundamental data point that helped with the reintroduction of the wolf. Mind you, I didn't do the re reintroduction of the wolf, but I'm really proud to say that my data were helpful in this effort. 
just as an aside, I'll say some of you have asked in the past about these black wolves in Yellowstone. This is an interesting story also of human introgression, of human impacts to wildlife in the Americas. It turns out that we know what the distribution of the black and the light colored genotype of wolves are. And the wolves from Yellowstone were introduced from this part of Canada. It turns out that these black wolves are actually the result of a hybridization of dogs with wolves in, uh, in the Western US. And the black genotype is thought to be favored in forested environments. So that's just an aside, but it's quite an interesting comment commentary because these wolves um, to reintroduce to Yellowstone came from this part of Canada. And they came, they were, they were chosen because they were really good at hunting elk and dealing with bison. So as wolves are reintroduced, remember this red line is the mean number of elk uh, from 29 to 60. And remember here we have the fires of 88. The wolves reintroduced, were reintroduced right here at 1995. And now you can see the population of elk declined relatively rapidly and consistently after that with a slight uptick toward the recent. So not only did wolf reintroduction really change the numbers of elk, um, I want to point out that these numbers come from flights, usually over the park. It changed the behavior of elk. And so instead of elk congregating in large grasslands, and particularly in the northern part of the park, they ended up spending more time in the forest and in the ecotone, the zone between the grassland and the forest. So elk are harder to detect in our counts today than they were in the past. There's another success story in Yellowstone, which many of you have heard about as well, and that's grizzly bears. Around 1800, grizzly bears occupied much of the American West, and slowly we extirpated them along with wolves in this predator control. So much so that grizzly bears, the lower, um, the, the grizzly bear that uh, is in Yellowstone is um, the only uh, grizzly bear south of this larger range that's intact. This is from a grizzly in Colorado known as Old Mo, and he was, he was extinct after the 1970s. So these grizzlies are a success because we've managed in this ecosystem to keep them going. But it's interesting because they weren't always a success story. We used to sit and watch bears eat our trash. We had large bleachers set up in this extraordinary place, Hayden Valley, a photo of which you see down here. There were dumps, garbage dumps from all the hotels, from all the visitors there. We would set up in the bleachers and watch them. The dumps were closed in 1970. There's still remnants of those dumps today. This photo shows a little bit of one of these old dumps. And the bears returned to the wild. They are all wild now, and they do what wild bears used to do. Not only do they eat top uh, these herbivores, but they also eat an extraordinary omnivorous uh, diet. Yellowstone, in fact, is the most intact tempered ecosystem on Earth. This is a menagerie of the species in Yellowstone. And I'll, I have to say that out of all of the species, the mammal species we know about, 93% of them have been found in, the, in two of the archaeological, two of the paleontological sites I excavated in Yellowstone. And because I just almost made that mistake there, archaeological sites are those sites that are associated with human accumulations and paleontological sites are those sites that are accumulating, accumulated without human intervention. So these are sites that are accumulated by carnivores and uh, other processes that I won't talk about right now. But even though Yellowstone is in a relatively intact ecosystem, it is confronted by the same kinds of forces that are eroding glo global biodiversity. One of four species are at risk of extinction based on the, the red list IUCN data that came out last year. This is an extraordinary uh, crisis that the globe is facing from, with everything from amphibians to corals to birds. And in fact, a quarter of all mammals are threatened with extinction because of these forces. Biodiversity in general is threatened in Yellowstone. 
it's threat threatened by exactly the same forces that are threatening um, uh, biodiversity around the world. Mortality, direct poaching and elimination of those species, hunting every last one down, toxins and pollution, climate change, land use change and habitat alteration and introduction of species that weren't co-evolved in the system. This is the Anthropocene. For those of you who have traveled with me, you know that the Anthropocene is a time period of Earth history that is dominated by human processes. We evolved embedded in nature, and now nature is embedded in humanity. We dominate the atmosphere, the biosphere, the cryosphere, the hydrosphere, and the geosphere. And this means that the processes that used to act without humans are now really totally beholden to us for their fate. Part of the reason is our population growth. And even in Yellowstone, the visitation of Yellowstone when I first got there in the 80s was down around 2 million people per year. And now we have over 4 million people visiting there. The greater Yellowstone ecosystem in general skyrocketed population growth in that area, where species like, humans like as well. Bozeman, for example, in Montana, north of the park, has grown 30% in just seven years. And the pandemic has forced these areas around Yellowstone, Jackson Hole, Idaho Falls, Bozeman, uh, and other parts of Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho to receive more and more uh, people moving to get uh, out of the, the places they live in elsewhere in the in US. So the, the pressure on these places is remarkable. There's direct mortality in Yellowstone. There are there is some poaching, but that's not as uh, as pro, as as a, a large impact as is, is 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 in other places like with elephants, for example, and large carnivores in Africa and elsewhere. Grizzly bears, you can see this is the Yellowstone ecosystem outlined here in, in green. And there are mortalities. Every one of these dots is a grizzly bear mortality. But it turns out that almost every one of these mortalities is outside the boundary of Yellowstone Park. Here's Yellowstone. And indeed, outside this area, which is known as the recovery zone of grizzlies. In fact, all, almost all of these mortalities of grizzly bears are outside the park and they're human caused for those that we know. They're, they're poached, they're hit by cars, or they're eliminated because the bears have somehow got into trouble. Another one close to home here is the gray wolf. The gray wolf was delisted on October 30th. There are lawsuits pending now, even as of this past week, there's more discussion about this. And this is an example of how even though we think the gray wolf is an American species, there's actually a debate about who manages species, who owns them. Is it the state's rights or is it the public's rights? And so it's a very interesting dichotomy and it's the challenge that confronts every species that is endangered in the world, local use and public ownership of a species itself. Who gets to decide? Climate change has impacted Yellowstone. I'm not gonna talk about fires, but of course that's a huge, a huge feature. White bark pine beetle. It's a native beetle, but it is in fact uh, confronted. Um, it's in fact uh, expanded dramatically from Mexico all the way, the pine beetles in general, all the way to Alaska. Up to 80% of the trees in parts of Yellowstone have uh, succumb to this beetle, a native beetle, but it's no longer controlled by very cold climate. Two weeks of below freezing temperature is what it takes to eliminate the high elevation beetles. And then normally every year they have to recolonize, so they never really uh, cause the trees to succumb. However, now they're succumbing. It turns out white bark pines are super, cones are super important for our top, one of our top predators, the grizzly bears. Wetlands are disappearing in Yellowstone too. And this isn't because of some sort of drilling outside or for wells, for example, because the watershed of Yellowstone is almost entirely contained in the park. And it is basically fueled by snowmelt 
and also paleo water. It turns out that this, these uh, ponds, here's the same photo, this is the same pond in 1995 and in 2005. In both of these examples, the ponds are drying up. That's caused a decline in our amphibian populations. These are different species of amphibians, salamanders, frogs, and a toad. And from 1992 to 2006, so just over uh, uh, just 17 years, you see this massive decline in the number of populations out of 58 different ponds in the northern part of Yellowstone, a big decline in their prevalence. And these are common amphibians. You also see that per pond, the number of species has declined dramatically. None of the ponds we investigated actually, this is from my grad student, Sarah McMenamum, none of them had more than four species or had four species um, in, uh, in 2006 to eight. And more and more species had none, more and more lakes had none. Yellowstone is also influenced by activities outside the park, such as mining. This is uh, a photo from Soda Butte Creek in 2008, copper, a thousand times the, the, the limit, the EPA limit, and lead, hugely uh, unhealthy water. You find that this expressed in fish. Although there's been a lot of cleanup, it turns out that every time this area floods, more and more of these old sediments are released and there's little fish kills below it. So even as recent as 2018, you can see the residual effects of mining that took place 100 years ago outside of Yellowstone. Mining continues to be a threat to Yellowstone. There are, you know, there's a lot of money to be made in gold, in diamonds, and all these precious metals that we need for our computers and beyond. And so there are constantly, there's constantly a debate about how to protect this resource. Uh, essentially, it all flows into the Yellowstone River. All of these, these ways flow into the Yellowstone River and beyond. There's also habitat transformation in Yellowstone, like elsewhere. These natural wild areas are becoming more and more isolated, more and more like islands in a sea of humanity. From space, this is after the 1988 fires, you could actually see the Yellowstone Park boundary. On this side is Forest Service land. You can see the clear cuts here. And on this side is Yellowstone Park boundary. Turns out actually, just as an aside, this red is what was burned in 1988. This is the initial start of the beginning of the Yellowstone fires started by woodcutters here and a cigarette uh, outside the park boundary. Yellowstone and many wild areas in the world are becoming isolated. This is from Big Sky. When I first got there, Big Sky didn't exist. And now there are just hundreds of miles of ski trails and horse trails and communities, and they're becoming more and more exclusive and harder and harder for anyone to access unless you have a lot of money. So Yellowstone is becoming isolated, and that means that it's hard for organisms to move between natural areas. So for example, this is a, uh, an example of elk migrations in the park. These are different uh, Label in color are different herds. Here's Yellowstone again for perspective, Yellowstone Lake. And although there are herds that remain in the park, most actually need to leave the park because Yellowstone generally receives quite a lot of snow, which means that forage for the winter is hard to get, hard to access for these elk. So mo many of them, if not most of these elk, migrate out of the park, which means they need protective buffer zones around them. Yellowstone itself cannot maintain biodiversity without connectivity to other places where organisms can feed and reproduce. We also are confronted with invasive species in this place. Uh, this is a true tragedy for me. When I first started working in Yellowstone, I worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service. And I captured, I lived in a backcountry cabin, and I captured, measured, weighed, sexed, and identified the fish, the, the cutthroat trout fish that spawned up in this area. Now, there are non-native lake trout, and they're vociferous eaters, and these are baby cutthroats in their guts. The first lake trout was actually found in 1994, and it has caused a dramatic decline in the number of, uh, of 
cutthroat trout that return to the spawning stream, completely causing a collapse of this particular food web. Bears, osprey, eagles can no longer depend on cutthroat trout because lake trout have different behavior. They're very deep and they do not use these creeks to spawn. So a really big dramatic decline. I was working in, in this particular park right around here. And again, lake trout first really found here in the 19, late, uh, early 1990s. The bottom line is that we can no longer use the past. We can't look to what we've always known about a place like Yellowstone or any other natural area in the world to predict the future. This is a little bit of a complicated chart, but I think it illustrates what I want to try and say. So on the bottom axis, you see time. And this is a proxy for temperature around the world. This is global temperature. And these are geologic time periods, the Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, and Holocene. You don't need to know them. But what I and every time you see these hash marks, it's a change in scale. So we go millions of years, tens of millions of years before present. Then you go millions of years before present. Then you go to hundreds of thousands of years before present. And finally, we end up in the thousands of years before present. So if you look at global temperatures, we see that in the Eocene, temperatures were really much higher than they are today. Here we are in what's known as the Holocene. This little blip of time where we have constant temperature for about 10,000 years, that's when we colonized and expanded. That's when we developed agriculture. That's when we built the New York cities of the world, the, the, the Beijings. This is when we basically settled down, grew crops, had animals domesticated and created our societies. We are used to tomorrow being like yesterday. So historical records have showed us that this is a very important time for human civilization. And here we are projected in the next 100 years for temperatures that are higher than they have been since about 2 million, 3 million years ago. Mind you, the average age of all these mammals I've been describing to you is usually older than 2 million years. So it's not just humans. We're really young. We're about 200,000 years old. We're a young species. But all the species we're used to seeing, they're not used to these high temperatures either. If we go into some of these climate models far into the future, we're talking about analogs for our future planet that are way beyond anything present um, species are experienced, have ever experienced, and we're almost back to the Cretaceous. So it's a super important thing to think about the relevance of our future and that our future is no longer like it used to be yesterday. But the good news is that Yellowstone serves as an example. My heart belongs to Yellowstone. I'm not the only one. Hopefully many of you have traveled to this place. It is a place I adore. Millions of people love Yellowstone. They get to come, four million people a year, get to escape their lives and go to this place. They get to see landscapes that are mostly unaltered by human activity. They get to embed themselves in bears and bison. They get to fish for native trout. This place is very close to America's heart. Because millions of people love this place, they act, they make a difference. And so there are initiatives, the Y to Y, uh, the Yellowstone to Yukon initiative, trying to wrangle up conservation easements, buffer lands, and making sure they're protected lands so that species as they respond to warming can move along the, the Rocky Mountains. There are the Western Wildway Priority Wildlife Corridors doing the same thing in the lower 48. Again, keeping these biodiverse regions somehow connected and making sure there are corridors so that places like the park don't remain islands, but in fact have peninsulas, have ways to go uh, to, for the animals to move inside and out. This is a hopeful story for me. 
And I would say that Wither Yellowstone is the world. This ecosystem has an extraordinary amount to tell us about our planet, to tell us stories of damage and repair, restoration, the wolf, the wolf, you get to see wolves. That was the last species that was missing in this intact ecosystem. This tells us a lot about hope. It gives us um, insights for the future of our planet. And with that, I'd like to stop sharing and invite Emily back. And again, thank you so much for your attention. And I'm, I think we're uh, about ready to answer some questions. I can't wait to see what they are gonna be. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, this is fantastic. But the first question for you is, given the impact of climate change and invasive species, how feasible is it to try and maintain the presence of pre-European species and still have a resilient and sustainable ecosystem functions? Really, really good question and a super important question. It actually gets really to the heart of something I've thought about a lot in the last decade. The Leopold Report, and this is the how parks have been managed for quite a long time. And that is something that says, you know, we kind of want to go back to Europe pre-European management. So we want to keep these iconic species in this place. So how do you do that when we have these invasive species and when species are going to want to move? They're going to want to move perhaps out of the park, colonize someplace further north, and we're going to have new species in. So this is where our idea of management has to change. How do you protect a place like Yellowstone? In fact, all of our parks, how do you protect it for a dynamics of the future? And I think this is where coming up with an my view would be to, uh, to basically to assemble a portfolio of natural lands. Those lands where we work hard to keep Joshua trees in Joshua Tree National Park, or we reinvent our idea of what we're actually preserving in those parks. So I would say in Yellowstone, even though much of it was established for its geologic resources, Yellowstone Falls, the, the thermal areas, in fact, it's part of our heart for many of us because of the biodiversity there. And so I would say we have to accommodate the loss of some species and the presence of new species. And exactly how we do that is something that really needs a lot of work. But I absolutely think that's a perfect question and really the big challenge of managing these reserves around the world. Thank you. Um, you also mentioned the role of artists and photographers in the past. Do you see their influence in addressing climate and biodiversity today? I absolutely do. I mean, I, I first of all, I tried to call out by by showing some of the most you know extraordinary images. The first image on my opening slide, the image of elk on migration, that's actually from a camera trap set up to really get a ground's eye view of these migrating elk. So that's photography, but even the picture of the menagerie of Yellowstone biodiversity, that is, you know, one picture captures so much that actually says what species are present. And I could give you a list, but that image is so much better at it. I think that communicating through art is, and, and, and actually the artistic process itself does a lot of catharsis. I've, I've taught classes about the fusion of art and science. And I think it is one of the reasons we have Yellowstone Park. In fact, one of the reasons we have parks in the world is because of that kind of co-mingling of the artist, the explorer, the documentary um, of the journey, the history of that. I think it's absolutely critical going forward because you have to somehow engage people's mind and their hearts to really want to save biodiversity. Is the white bark pine extinct? Um, how is the white bark pine cones important to grizzlies? And then just since we're bringing up grizzlies, how many grizzlies are currently in Yellowstone and is this population stable, growing or declining? And has human pressure on the bear population changed their behaviors? Woo, I know. <laughs> lots of questions there. Let me start with the white bark pine. And actually in the links that I've shared with you, there is a little bit of um, a story about white bark pine in there. But I would say that um, the white bark pine are important because the beetles that are confronting white bark pine, as I said, they're native. 
And as I said, it's directly an impact of climate change that's causing these beetles to expand. What's happening is they're reproducing several times a year instead of once a year. And they're overwintering. They're able to overwinter in the tree, which means that they just get started right away at basically killing the tree. They're not extinct, white bark pine are not extinct, but they are threatened in the Yellowstone ecosystem. And they're threatened because the, the mortality of these trees is so pervasive and they are the high elevation tree in the Yellowstone ecosystem. So why does that matter for bears? This is a whole week's worth of lectures, but I'll try and condense it. White bark pine have really big seeds, big nuts in their cones. And those turn out to be uh, really desirable by a lot of birds, in particular, a Clark's nutcracker and also red squirrels. And the red squirrels, you know, the nutcrackers open the cones and the red squirrels grab the seeds and they bury them in their middens. And this is what they use to uh, make it through the winter, make it through the fall. And the bears go and they uncover all those seeds and they eat it and they are loaded with fats and carbohydrates. And it turns out that you can count the number of white bark pine cones on a tree and predict the overwinter survival of grizzly bear cubs. So the number of white bark pines on a tree in the fall will tell you how successful grizzly bear cubs will be the following summer. That tells you how important they are to grizzly bear survival. So grizzly bears, there are somewhere between three and 500 bears. There's always a debate about whether or not they're doing well. They seem to have rec recovered quite a lot. And they're, right now it's whether or not we want to maintain their, uh, the dynamic equilibrium of the reproductive in individuals or just the count of the number of bears. And so I believe I put another reference, if I didn't, I will try and do this, uh, um, to what that debate actually is and what those data say. But a lot of the data I showed you are from a, a site called All Grizzly by Dave Matson, who used to be on the grizzly bear study team. And you can find a lot of materials there. But there's debate about whether or not they're able to maintain themselves in the absence of, um, it, into, in this ecosystem in the, in, with the kind of the, the food support that we have there. And so that's the debate. Just as there are debates with wolf population, there's always a debate about this, the size of the grizzly bear population. And has human pressure on the bear population changed their behaviors? Human pressure does change their behavior. So I told you early on, the, we used to actually love to see them. And so we drew them in. Um, and if any of you have been to Yosemite, now that's a black bear, not the grizzly bear, but they are large pests and they're very savvy. They're smart and they're very large pests to humans and campers and food and everything in, in Yosemite. Yellowstone doesn't have those same kinds of issues, but it used to have those similar issues. There were there are still bear jams, but mostly the bear jams are because bears are out there going after some sort of root or tuber, or they're looking for pocket gophers in the spring, or they're eating a carcass that may be a bison carcass. And so people are stopped looking at the bear doing its natural thing, as opposed to sitting on a bleacher, watching them eat their discarded food. Bears, sometimes the, the bears that get in trouble the most, like many mammals, the ones that, that, that disperse are usually young males and they get in trouble. They sometimes end up in human uh, dwellings, but bears are not in Yellowstone are not habituated to people the way bears, for example, in Yosemite are, black bears are. They're dangerous animals. They're not the most dangerous animal in Yellowstone. Probably the most dangerous animal is bison. There are more mortalities with bison than bears, but um, they're still, uh, they're, they're basically still wild. Thank you. Thank you for all of the, answering all those questions in one. Um, <laughs> What policies and conservation measures do you think are critical for preserving and protecting uh, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem? Um, and how can we mitigate the effects of climate change on the sensitive ecosystem? Mitigating the effects of climate change is really a global endeavor, right? This is, um, I tried to give you a little insight about what climate change does locally. I barely touched on all the forces. Um, I 
could spend a year giving lectures about all the little things, zebra mussels, changes in precipitation, you know, changes in snowfall. But I, I do wanna say that, um, so climate change is really a, an international problem and we have a lot of leadership nationally. Um, there, are, there are ways that we could contribute to uh, climate change in the greater, in the lower 48, in particular in the, in the West, by really thinking a lot more about the interaction between forests and fires. So since the fires of 1988, which was really a watershed year for fires in the American West, in 1988, the fires have since then have really increased in frequency and increased in extent. They've, they're just much more common, much larger, and they burn much more intensely. And part of that is because of climate change. So in terms of what we can do to mitigate it locally, it's tough. It's a really tough thing to do. In terms of conservation measures in Yellowstone and in places like Yellowstone, it's local activism. There is, you know, I, I tried to present this when I very quickly, when I talked about the wolf and the grizzly bear. And um, really there is, there are states' rights, there are park service policies, there are economic implications for all the surrounding communities, which are very important, not only the visitation. So all these communities have really taken a hit during COVID because there aren't as many visitors, although there are more visitors at off seasons than there used to be because this is what people wanna do now that they can, they can be mobile. But those impacts and whose impact is the most important, whose voice is the loudest is critically important. So when we're talking about a national park, it, it does belong to us. Um, it is an American park and yet the often the people that speak the loudest are the local senators and Congress people because they're representing their state's views. Their state's views, so Liz Cheney is a Washington uh, congressperson and she's the one that really said this about, it, sh it should be the Wyoming, it should be the people that are affected directly by wolves that speak. It's like the, the local farmers in, in, uh, in Africa who are confronted by, by elephants raiding their crops. This is a very important thing because local people's economic survival is critical, but it's also an important thing for us. So how do we get along with um, our view of what species and this place should be and the local view of ownership and the species and diversity and livelihoods that people have in their backyard. So I think this is where local activism, local uh, you know, expressing your voice, expressing your opinion to your policymakers, no matter where they are, and, and actually contributing to some of these efforts like the Yellowstone to Yukon or um, the Yellowstone Association are, are very, very important. And this goes for any natural lands anywhere in the world. Thank you. You um, mentioned the Yellowstone to Yukon, and there is a question about um, how do political and um, board, indeed cross-border issues impact the initiatives such as um, Yellowstone to Yukon? Do you think you could speak to that in particular? or? Um, well, so this is all, again, it's all about negotiation and it's all about finding representation across borders are, that's super challenging. Um, and, and we have it in some ways a lot easier in, Mex in, in the Americas because we have for our you know, United States biodiversity, not only do we have Canada in between, we share a lot of the biodiversity that Canada has. And so where goes Canadian biodiversity, so does ours. And likewise, you know, we have Alaska, you know, Canada is right in between Alaska and the lower 48. And so this is a place where a lot of our coordination is super important for these north temperate species. That's also important in Mexico. And for example, the, the building of the wall was a really a horrible thing for things like the cross border species like the jaguar. So what do we do there? How do we negotiate these issues? Because in some ways the, the best place for biodiversity is where there's not as many people that actually turns out to be a reasonably good place for 
migration of humans as well. And so there, there are a lot of challenges when you go across borders about who owns the species and who owns the policies. And that's why some of these um, NGOs and some of these um, you know, international initiatives are really good because a lot of that is, is worked out. Another question is, you note Anthropocene in your title, yep. and um, the question is that they're curious about your choice of that word specifically. There is a scientific oh, discourse as well as looser interpretations of that word, um, yes. including human impacts. Yes. What is your view on the need for scientific Anthropocene working group definition uh, based on the definition of uh, definitive golden spike visible in uh, stratigraphy? Is scientific Anthropocene necessary to shift human behaviors and policies towards environmental efforts, protected areas, carbon neutral policies, rewilding, and more? Excellent question. Somebody is well read. And this is actually a close to my heart right now. And um, I'll just say this has a, a very important Stanford component to it. And that is that the Anthropocene, yes, is used very, it's actually used more with social sciences and humanities really than it is in science. And yes, I absolutely think that the word Anthropocene really conveys the difference. And so there's a weighty meaning behind it that I use deliberately. Um, I think it's, it's a, it, is the, it is the transition. In terms of the formal definition in the golden spike, this is something I'm involved in. Right now, there's been an agreement. There's a very arcane process about how you, you know, basically calibrate the stratigraphic record and what names you apply where. And in this case, we're, the, the geologic community is pretty much in agreement that it's going to be around 1950. Around 1950, a lot of things happen. It's not like 1950, 1949 on December 31st and January 1st, 1950, everything shifted. But 1950 turns out to be a really critical watershed moment because that's when things went exponential. Everything from our use of resources, the population, and also the number of McDonald's. I mean, just a remarkable number of changes to the planet happened around then. It's just an exponential shift. The reason it's close to my heart at Stanford is because Stanford's Jasper Ridge also houses Searsville Reservoir. Searsville Reservoir um, is dammed by a dam that was built in the 1890s. And it has one of the most extraordinary sedimentary records on the planet representing 126 years. It's 10 meters of 126 years. Sometime I'll have to talk about this. It is an active area of research for my lab and many other people in USGS and other collaborators. We are one of seven sites being considered as the golden spike for the term Anthropocene in the geologic record. We capture the late 1800s all the way through to, to today. And it is an amazing record with extraordinary data, including our nuclear bomb testing, which is one of the reasons the 1950 is trying to, is being assigned as a, as a global event. And that's because um, that's when our, really our evidence of, of atomic testing becomes uh, global. Great question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you all, you referenced the pandemic um, and its impact a little bit, but that is a question that has come in about the impact that pandemic has, has had on Yellowstone. I think you talked about just the limited amount of tourism, but what else has the pandemic brought to Yellowstone? Um, so there's a lot I don't know. I did. I have been there since the pandemic started, and it was super interesting because I was there in the fall, normally at a time where there aren't very many people in the park and many of the, in fact, many of the supporting uh, businesses were closed and they usually are closed because that's the time of year that, that visitation declines quite rapidly. Um, I was surprised to see how many people were there. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if I haven't looked at the data directly, but I would, wouldn't be surprised based on word of mouth conversations I had if visitation was really high relative to other um, falls. And part of that is because of kids in school. And so families could travel more easily with their kids who were not in school physically and, and visit. And, and the same is true for business leaders and um, our business, um, you know, people work in the economy more generally is that it was easier to travel because you could be remote and still work. Um, 
so I heard anecdotally that there were a lot more people than, than we all expected. Um, I think that the that what really impacted the area, and I also heard this when I was there in the fall, and again, I don't know what the summary is now, but is that the local businesses, uh, the grocery stores, the gas stations, the restaurants, uh, many of those not only were closed, but they really did not, were not full. And so I, I think this is, um, this is a super important thing to realize that, that the local businesses did take a hit. But I will point out that there is a rapid growth. People are buying land and houses in the Yellowstone area just like crazy. And I think it's because once people realize they really can work from afar, they're wanting to have a place to do it that is uh, a little farther removed from where they normally work. And do you think that the wildlife had a, you know, was impacted by the less tourists? Or do you think that, the, that in, because there were still enough people coming in and out that there wasn't necessarily... No, it was not necessarily noticeable. I, mean, I don't I just, know the answer the to that cars. question. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. The wildlife, there is a cadence to life in Yellowstone. And um, just because I didn't, I don't actually know the synopsis of, I don't know the story of visitation. I don't really know exactly how the wildlife were impacted. Um, so I can't really answer that question. I wouldn't be surprised if they were, um, but it all depends on when the impacts and how they compare. And again, I just don't know. Were the megafauna like mammoths in Yellowstone? And if so, what do you think caused their extinction? So um, megafauna, so the mammoths, the um, you know, they're, you know, the giant ground sloths, saber-toothed cats, absolutely the dire wolves, absolutely amazing, wonderful beasts of the Pleistocene were not in Yellowstone. And the reason they weren't in Yellowstone is because Yellowstone was covered by ice. And so in, you know, by the time that they, it's possible that some of them, you know, survived right before, you know, right after the ice melted and they were in Yellowstone right after that, but we found no evidence for that. I always hoped that I would find it, um, but I have not found any evidence of that, but they were certainly in the region around Yellowstone. So um, near Cody, for example, around to the north of Yellowstone in Montana, in Idaho, lots of sites that contain Pleistocene, not only megafauna, but microfauna too. And so, yes, they were in that area. What caused the extinction of the mammoths? Well, there's a lot of debate, but it's kind of what's causing biodiversity loss today. It's probably a combination of environmental change. So there was a dramatic warming at the end of the Pleistocene and people came and people, we brought our dogs, we probably brought diseases and we brought efficient ways of hunting that megafauna in the Americas were not used to dealing with. And so it was a combination, I'm guess, guessing of all of those, but humans are pretty, pretty deliberate at hunting the last things out when we wanna be. Um, so we've talked about um, various kinds of uh, animals that are in danger of extinction. Do you have any uh, sense of, uh, of what the situation is with insects? Oh, it's another area of act active research. And that's actually what we're going to be using. Um, I think we'll be doing quite a lot of work on the core in this very thing. The insect apocalypse is just horrifying to me. It's probably one of the worst bits of news that I've read about biodiversity in the last decade. Um, and I, I'm one who just can't imagine the planet without an elephant, but the insect apocalypse is real. I, I guess we could put a link about that in. I didn't talk about this at all. Um, and it, it gets to our, you know, our backyard in, in California, the monarch decline. It's not just monarchs, it's hundreds of butterfly species. And if we start looking a little bit more closely, it's all sorts of insects. There's no moths that are lights at night anymore in the summer. When we drive across country, I have way fewer bugs on my windshield than I used to. I used to have to stop almost more frequently for gas than for gas just to clean my windshield and those times are gone. It's true, um, we are, the problem is we don't have a good record uh, historic record, and we don't have good understanding of what's caused it. But I, I suggest if you haven't read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, take a look at that, because we are poisoning our environment with pesticides, 
with chemicals and then climate change is leading to the demise of many of these insects that are dependent upon their phenology, their development, their association you know, with butterflies, in particular the host plant, the development of plant and their movements are, are very closely tied to uh, environmental factors. Thank really, you. really disturbing thing. Up to you know, 80% decline in some places like Germany and Panama. So we know less about it in the US because we have less of a long-term record, but it's, a, it's something I'm actively working on. Uh, but alumni uh, who are here to, with us today are curious about your favorite place in Yellowstone. And aside from visiting Yellowstone in the standard way, do you recommend other ways to visit um, eco groups or restoration? Uh, gr oh, great questions. My favorite place, um, hmm, secret spots versus favorite <laughs> places. Are they the same? <laughs> well, what am I? I mean, I, I've been almost everywhere in Yellowstone. I could probably close my eyes and, you know, I mean, it's like I have a map in my brain. I really love the thoroughfare region. It's very, very hard to get to. Um, it's pretty far. It's one of the most um, remote parts of the lower 48, but it is an amazing place. It's where Yellowstone, the two ocean plateau and on Snake River on one side and the Yellowstone on the other. It's a really beautiful, beautiful place. I encourage visitors to go there. I think Pelican Valley likewise is a really magic place. It's a really hot spot for bears. Um, but it is, it's got loaded little tiny hot springs and thermal areas that are surprises. Of course, the Lamar Valley, it used to be a very, very undervisited part of the park, but with the reintroduction of the wolves really starting there at, at the base of um, Specimen Ridge, that's where they were. Um, that's near my excavations. That place is now a very um, popular place to visit. Um, and then Quadrant Mountain in the Northeast and, and Electric Peak are both extraordinary places as well. I'm less of an aficionado of Old Faithful and the, the hot springs around there than many people, but they are magic in the winter. In terms of how to go, I, you know, there, all the places in the park are enchanting for different reasons. The Yellowstone uh, Lake Hotel is really beautiful, old 1920s style. Um, Tower Lodge is great with cabins. And, uh, and I have to say, I still love to camp in a tent. <laughs> so I just think the magic of being in a tent, and there are lots of ways to do that with your dog, for example, if you go to the Forest Service lands around Yellowstone, you can't go wrong. <laughs>